to RPMC, my name's Mark. Today I'm going to be talking about this album here, and it is Belo Part 4 by David Maxim Misic. So David Maxim Misic is a guitarist and composer based in Serbia. He's been releasing music for over a decade at this point under his own name, as well as some other projects. So the initial release that I discovered him through was Belo Part 1, which was his first EP. And since then, he's gone on to release, obviously, four of uh, the Belo series, but also some other albums and EPs as well. So we'll do a track-by-track -track overview of the album and my sort of brief thoughts on it and why you should pick it up. So Belo Part 4 was released last year in 2022. Uh, came out on vinyl a couple of months ago. And it really is a phenomenal album. Um, it's, as I say, a culmination of his entire career in a way and you can tell this is a very personal album a very meaningful and emotional album and for a time it was kind of almost stuck in development hell uh, so to speak and I think it was worth it um, for it to take as long as it did to release uh, it was almost nine years I think um, between the release of Below 3 and Below 4 there were releases other than the Below series in between, but these are kind of like his main thematic uh, series. So a lot of personal feelings are put into this album, uh, themes around family and life and death, and it really does come through in the music itself. Obviously I'm going to go through the album, but I think in many ways it's a disservice for you to just take my word as gospel for this album you really should check it out it doesn't matter what format um, but please do listen to this album and listen to his other works if you can because I think he's one of the most underrated composers of any sort of contemporary era he's able to convey emotion and feeling in such a strong way in the work that he does and I can't think of many other composers or musicians that can do it as well as he does uh, at the moment. So the first track, Crumbs, it's a very cinematic track. I would say it's almost like a palate cleanser uh, to kind of warm you up to the album, just kind of bring the mood up and set the tone for what's to come. A very short piece, very cinematic as I say, and there are some callbacks straight off the bat, which I feel are references to Belo Part 3, and the initial, uh, the intro song on that album, uh, which is called Everything's Fine. So I would say, if you haven't listened to his other work, I would listen to Belo Part 3 before jumping onto this one, because there are sort of important references which don't have the full impact if you only ever hear this one. So, as I said before, do check his other work out as well, because it's all kind of wrapped up into one kind of big work in a sense. Two main highlights of this track, as I say it is a short one, but the two main highlights, there's some whistling parts about midway through which sound really kind of haunting and a bit jaunty. Uh, that really really sounds fantastic and there's a uh, Saz line at the end of the song, uh, Saz being like a sort of folk instrument uh, which sounds amazing. Uh, he's used it on some other tracks before, but it's really used a fantastic effect on this track. Of Bliss, the second track, again, not a full, full track, but definitely more of a full track than Crumbs. Uh, there's a riff in it, which is really, really fantastic. You sort of hear it about halfway through, where he just bends up into the note, and oh, the riff writing that he does he has this uncanny ability to be very heavy, but also very tasteful. Um, none of his work has ever really kind of gone overboard in terms of being heavy or genty. Um, you know, for a prog guitarist to have the restraint that he does while also being able to convey the message that he wants to convey, it's a very, I feel like it's a very difficult task and he, you know, he nails it. There's also a very small vocal snippet in here, uh, Feels Like Love's A Million Miles Away, which is something that gets referenced again later in the album. 
Third track is Itch. Uh, on the vinyl release, it's actually labelled incorrectly on the track listing. So track three and track four are swapped. Uh, but when you play it, they are actually as the album is intended. So it's just the actual uh, track listing on the back of the album. So do bear that in mind if you pick this one up. This is called Itch, even though the vinyl listing doesn't say that this is Itch, but it is. So Itch is a kind of full-bodied, heavy, David Maximisic like characteristic track. There's lots of really catchy riffs. There's lots of fantastic, like weird folky kind of instrumentation going on in the background. Uh, there's a the the main sort of riff of the song has this fantastic like herta part, like a uh, bit that's like about midway through the riff. And it, again, it, there's lots of earworms throughout the entire album that kind of get stuck with you. And that's one that really stuck with me. That very addictive sounding kind of riff. About the midway point, it kind of breaks it down and it goes into a new riff which is very Rush-esque. The interval between the two riffs is a very definite reference to Milk Tooth from the album Who Bit The Moon which was released in 2017 by David Maximisic. And that's one of the very definitive references and uh, lay motifs that you hear throughout the album. There are tons so I'm not going to highlight all of them and part of the fun is kind of like finding them for yourself. But it is really nice to kind of hear these callbacks throughout the album. After that, track four, DX2 Is Me. Uh, so this was released as a lead single from the album and it's an earworm in the purest sense. The melody of the track is pretty much present throughout. And I remember when the single was first released, before we'd heard anything else from this album, I was whistling the melody for days on end it's so so catchy but again still really tasteful there's no like wasted notes or anything there's not a lot i can say outside of that it's just such a catchy melody and the solo part on the track as well is really phenomenal of grief track five very short track and quite a haunting um impactful beautiful track very folky and as i said that's something that he uses a lot in his music but this he really kind of leans into it and it's almost like sort of backing atmosphere for some sort of kind of film that you would have set in the wilderness or something. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, as I say, it's a short one, but fantastic. Fading Memories is the next track and this starts off with, to me, it feels like a reference to Any Other Name by Thomas Newman, aka the Plastic Bag song from... Um, American Beauty, you know, the piano piece. Whether or not it's intentional, I don't know, but it does certainly feel like that. Uh, the piano line changes into what's definitely a reference to the song Universe in a Crayon from David Maximisic's uh, Eco EP. That's the intro track from that EP. And that's a very obvious reference uh, between the two. It's almost exactly the same uh, piano line across the across the two. So as I say, it's a piano-led track, but it does slowly build up. It's got this very good way of adding layers upon layers upon layers and building out a space and building out a soundscape. So it slowly builds into like an orchestral part and there's a fretless instrument on here. I'm not sure if it's a saz like it is on crumbs, but that kind of timbre of the fretless instruments just has some kind of like weird kind of funkiness to it, which you obviously don't really get in Western music at all. And it just adds to the atmospheric, the kind of weird mystic feeling of his music. So this kind of ebbs and flows throughout the track. Uh, you've got kind of like a build up to an orchestral and horn section back down and back up. And I think this may be one of the most underrated tracks on the album. I feel like probably a lot of people won't pay as much attention to, uh, to this track as they would the songs with vocals on, but this one is phenomenal. Away is the next track. Pretty short one, but thematically very, very important in my opinion. This features Alexandra Gielmash, who is a longtime collaborator with uh, Maxim Misic. She does some fantastic vocal work on tons of his work and she also has some fantastic solo work as well again i'm gonna say it several times but just check out everything that i mention in this because there's going to be lots of things that you can find out if you like this you're going to like everything else that i mention so the start of the track is really just like esoteric odd audio there's not a 
ton of like music so to speak uh, lots of weird like little samples and audio clips of things and it's again something he's done before where you have like weird almost text-to-speech kind of sounds just saying what could be random lines but presumably have some sort of thematic meaning behind them but the main draw of this song is the vocal part as i said from Yelmash. the line are we there yet which is a reference to the the final track of the album but the melody of it and the acoustic accompaniment that comes behind it really kind of that's <laughs> it's kind of like the midpoint of the album but it's also kind of where part two of the album starts in a way you've had the cinematic build up and this is where we get into the really thematic important parts and there's this huge riff that kind of builds and builds and builds and then stops and it goes straight into the next song which is called cry so Cry starts with like an odd piano line and uh, weird saxophone backing. It's something that I would expect someone like John Sermon to compose. Um, if you're familiar with his work, it's very similar to that. So this song has two vocal features on it. Alexandra Yelamash from the last track, but also Vladimir Lalek, who is again a long-time collaborator with Maxim Misic. This may be my favourite vocal performance that he's done. Usually he's quite lean, he leans into a very kind of high pushed kind of vocal. This is a lot more understated and it's a vocal performance that perhaps some people don't realize he can do. Um, but it's a lot more kind of heartfelt and in a way straightforward, but actually very beautiful as well. Midway through, it switches to this weird kind of like thumped guitar riff, very animals as leaders if you're familiar with their work and again we've got uh, Yelmash back on the vocals and it kind of goes back and forth between Yelmash and Lalik kind of repeating their parts of the song until the end of the track. Track 9 is a song called Of Hope. <laughs> this starts off with basically what I would call like a David Maxim Misic chill beat to study to. Um, there's no other way to really describe it but it does then build up into one of my favorite riffs that he has ever done. And it's so simple, but it's so epic feeling. And it's a lot like how Devin Townsend has this kind of simple riff structure, but huge production behind his work. And this track is kind of exactly the same in that regard when it comes to the riff. And it finishes on this haunting lead line. Fantastic track. The penultimate track, Wedding, is undoubtedly the heaviest song on the album and the closest to what the album gets to straightforward prog metal. He's a prog metal guitarist but it's so far removed from the run-of-the-mill stuff so even getting close to it it's not the same as the kind of other ilk you would get within this sort of subgenre. Track starts off with some vocal snippets which I believe are samples that we used on below three on the track Daydreamers and I think it was Maxim Misic's niece uh, just a recording of her like playing and drawing and her singing to herself again another callback to previous work as he's been doing a lot throughout this album the main riffs on this song are very close to what he did with the Ego EP and we have Yelmash again on vocals to essentially build this out into the most fully fledged traditional song that you can get on this album. In the middle we have this sort of ambient passage which then breaks down and then builds slowly back up into this epic huge solo and then it slows right down to a very cinematic, very choral, post-rocky kind of sounding soundscape which kind of just punctuates the last minute or so of the track. It's really haunting and kind of moody way to end the song but it leads perfectly into the final track so the final song on the album are we there yet starts off with a really heavy bass tone um super distorted and it's just the bass and alexandra yelmash's vocals and go through that for a, a passage and then it slows down into again just a little guitar driven part with the vocals over the top this song doesn't really have a very traditional like verse chorus or anything like that. It's essentially two parts and in my opinion the perfect way to end the album. So about the two minute mark it builds up to a very definite reference to the lay motif from Daydreamers on Below Part 3. And this is very much a counterpoint to that track. 
it's a real tear jerking moment and a, like a summation and a culmination of his career up until this point. It's kind of a bookend to what he has done up until now. And it feels like a big cathartic emotive release for the entire album and his career, as I say. It's got a callback to Daydreamers in it, but instead of having a vocal feature from his niece, it's a vocal snippet of his infant son. And as I said at the start, really highlights the thematic importance of this album, birth, death, and life and parenthood. And I don't think there's a stronger way to end an album than how he has ended this album. It really is an emotional way to kind of close off everything that this album means and everything that his career has meant up until this point. There's no real way to describe it. It is just a perfect end. So overall, this is a phenomenal piece of work. And again, as I like to do, this is something that really works on vinyl. It just has that feel, that kind of soulfulness to it that some albums may never have. This just feels so passionate, such a work of love that having it on vinyl and listening to it and not being able to skip tracks and jump around really highlights the importance of what this music means uh, and what the release of this album would have meant to David Maximisich. As I did last week, I'll just go for a couple of other recommendations. If you like this, what you may also like. Obviously, all of his other work, um, <laughs> there's enough references in here that if you enjoy anything on this, you're going to enjoy the other stuff that he's done as well. That's obvious. I'd also recommend checking out any work by Pliny, who is kind of another one of these people who's in this sort of subgenre of esoteric, fusion-y, guitar-led composers. And his work has a very similar sort of emotional hook to it. Depending on what you enjoy in particular from this, you may also like the album Catch 33 by Meshuggah. Um, I know in terms of the musical content they're miles apart, but the way this album is put together it does feel like one cohesive work and Catch 33 by Meshuggah has that same sort of feeling to it. And I think as well realistically, if you're familiar with David Maxim Misic or that kind of prog metal sort of subgenre, you've probably heard of Meshuggah, you probably know or like them at the very least. So if you haven't listened to Catch 33, definitely check that out as well because that's probably their best album and has that same kind of full product of work in a single album kind of feel. I'd also recommend the composition work of Joe Hisaishi, who you're probably familiar with if you've ever watched any Studio Ghibli films. That same kind of melancholic, happy, sad vibe that this album gives off as well. Outside of music, I recommended a book last time with the Biosphere album, so I'm going to recommend a book this time as well. This is The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows by John Koenig. Now, you may have seen some of this on the initial blog, which was uh, made for the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. There are some words in this dictionary which really go along with how the album feels. So it's worth kind of picking up and going through or checking out the blog at the very least to kind of get a grasp on some of these newfangled words that have been made up that really do hit the mark in terms of that wistful, um, emotive feeling that the album gives. So that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you've checked this album out if you haven't already. And please let me know if there's anything else you'd like us to check out on the channel, any lists, etc. that you'd like to see. And other than that, we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.